Brothers and sisters, I greet you warmly in the wonderful name of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome you to the second night of our revival services and I trust and hope that tonight will truly be a blessing to everyone gathered here. Can we just turn to our neighbor and say, God loves you. And can we just turn to another neighbor and say it with confidence this time, God loves you. Because brothers and sisters, we are gathered here because of God's love. Amen. We are only gathered here because of God's love. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for power is made perfect in weakness. And so brothers and sisters, we are not gathered here because we are good. We are gathered here because God loves us. We are not gathered here because we are righteous. We gather because God loves us. We don't gather here because we are strong. We gather here because God loves us. And so let us worship a God this evening who loves us dearly. And we will begin with the hymn, there shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. Let's stand. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of God. There shall be seasons refreshing. Showers of blessing. Reviving again over the hills and the valleys. Let us continue to stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Begin to feel, as we were told yesterday, Jesus in our boat. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this privilege you have given us to push on. 
to get to the other side at your word. We thank you for what you have for us. To have an experience that will stay with us the rest of our life. We thank you for the assurance that where two or three meet in your name, you are there. You want to take us to a higher horizon. So you have brought us here not only to talk about someone's heartwarming experience, but to have an experience of our own. Lord, we meet in your name. The name Jesus at the mention of which every knee bow and every tongue confesses that you are Lord. It is the name that gives us victory. It's the name that comforts us. It's the name that gives us hope for the uncertainty. Lord, there's a reason for this gathering. We may not understand at the beginning, but as we keep our trust in you, and as we go through the experience, with you, O oh Lord, we know we will surely become what you have planned for us. And that is where we are going to rejoice. And that's where we are going to celebrate. Speak to us, O oh Lord. Give us an experience we need. Experience to move on. Experience to live on. Experience to identify ourselves with you as the Holy God, as a loving God, as all sufficient God. Rain upon us, O oh Lord. The strength we need, the breakthrough we need, the healing we need. Give us an experience of our eyes opening, our ears opening. That we can say, the Lord is with us. Bless this gathering and let this experience be to us the foundation, the inspiration, the motivation, the source of power and strength to do exploit in your name. You love us as you love Peter. Even when he disappointed you, you did not throw him away. But you gave him food to eat. And for three times you asked him, Do you love me? Father, we approach your calling. We approach what you have done in our lives over the attitude of Peter we easily lose sight of our faith and go our own way according to our feelings and our desires this evening Lord we pray that you cleanse us once again 
so that anything that is pulling us aside anything that is dragging us from your love will be eliminated from our lives that we will be empty to flow with you so that the feeling of the Holy Spirit will be all that we have so we can move with the power of the Spirit Father let us hear in our hearts your word once again your question do you love me and give us the grace to respond positively yes Lord we love you give us this experience give us this touch Give us this understanding that we can say I see a new heaven. I see a new people of God. I see a new believers. And I see a new Methodist. That the old will be past and all will be new. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. And as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. be seated. I now welcome our circuit steward, Sister Jacinta James, to bring us words of welcome. I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this evening? Yes, we are all happy to be in the house of the Lord. So the pleasure is mine to welcome on your behalf our brother, because he is our brother, our brother, Reverend Marlon Hestick, and our sister, Mrs. Hestick, to our chapel once more. And we wait anxiously for your word this evening. Or uh, maybe it might be night. It might be night, more night. I also want to welcome our friends who are among us, all visitors, as well as our brothers and sisters from the Georgetown Mount Cook circuit. I also want to welcome our friends and members from the Kingston Chatebele circuit. We trust that as we go through this act of worship, that all our hearts will be truly blessed and that we would leave here in a better position than when we came in, knowing that our God continues to be a God of wonder, a God of miracles, a God who always awes us. And if he's not awing us, then he's not God. So we continue to be awed by his presence and in his presence. So may God continue to bless us all if you're celebrating a birthday or anniversary this week, may God bless you as you celebrate. God bless us. Amen. Amen. And brothers and sisters, we continue to worship God as we invite the Zone 3 Praise and Worship team to come and lead us in some choruses. Do we want to worship God this evening? Do we want to worship him in spirit and in truth? Let us open our hearts and our minds and our souls to God as we invite the praise and worship team. Hallelujah. God is good. And all the time. I said God is good. 
and all the time. Spirit check. Spirit check. Praise God. If you know you're here to worship, let us stand on our feet as we lift our voices, as we lift our hands, as we lift everything to the heavens. Psalm tell, the Psalms tells us and reminds us that we are to ask God to lead us and to lead us in a way of straight, a straight and narrow way so that when our enemies look upon us, they will not see us fall. That's our first hymn, our first song here today, Lead Me Lord, so that I will follow. So lead me, Lord, I will follow. Lead me, Lord, I will go. You have called me, I will answer.
on God and you wait on him to lead you. I know that wherever he leads you is going to be called holy ground. Because I tell you brothers and sisters, tonight we have been led in a place where we can say this is holy ground. This is holy ground. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say this is holy ground. This is holy ground. Praise God. Praise God. This is holy ground. We are standing on holy ground.
praise God. God is good all the time. We're in God's presence when we're going to worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Tell your neighbor the Spirit of the Lord is in this place. Praise God. Praise God. All the other gods, they are the works of men. But you are the most I got. Hey, the praise God. There is a light. Sing all the other gods, they are the works of men. But you are the most I got. It's all the other gods. All the other gods. They are the works of But you are the most I got. There is a light, you Jehovah. You are the most high. Sing, you are the most I got. You are, you are the most high. You are the most I got. But you are the most I got. There is a light. All the other gods, all the other gods. Thank you, Adam. But you are the most I got. There is a light. Jehovah, you are the most I But you, you are the most I got. There is a light, Jehovah, you are the most I got. you are the most I got. You are, you are the most I 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 you are the most high. You are, you are the most high. 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 Wow, God is good all the time. I know all the time. We are my rural church worshipers. Rural church worshipers. Wave your hand. Rural church worshipers. Not in King's song. Let's go. Rural worship worsh, worshipers. Let's go. Let's go. You gotta be rooted and grounded in the name of the Lord. You gotta be rooted and in this holy world. Cause if you want to You gotta move to that from me You gotta move to that from me In the name of the Lord You gotta move to that from me In the name of the Lord You gotta move to that from me In this holy world Cause if you want to move to heaven You got to be, you got to root it and In the name of You got to root it and Come to me, come to me, come to me, come to me, come to 
Hallelujah. Because in his name, there's no greater majesty. In his name, there's no greater majesty. 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 Worship his majesty. Worship, worship, worship. Majesty. Majesty. Worship. Majesty. Worship is majesty. Unto Jesus be your glory, honor, and praise. Sing, oh, majesty, majesty, who worship my
Come on, worship him without the music. Worship his majesty. Because there's one instrument that never fails, is your voice. Jesus who died is now glorified. King of all kings, and Jesus who died. Can somebody just say Jesus? Jesus? Brothers and sisters, we began this service speaking of one man. When we prayed, we prayed to one man. We sang the first hymn and it was the glory to one man. We just sang a series of choruses and it is to one man. How great this man must be. Brothers and sisters, come on brothers and sisters, how great this man must be. That... This entire service, everything that will be done and has been done is about one person. And that is the one and true living God. And so brothers and sisters, as I was there and, and reflecting, we are about to go into a period of testimonies. And one of the things I, even during today, that I thought about is how much God continues to be good to us, whether we are good to him or not. How much God continues to be good to us, whether we are good to him or not. That's why everybody has a testimony. Whether you are Christian or not, there is some testimony that you have. Because God continues to be good to everyone, no matter what. Because he loves us all. And even today in the church office we were discussing, and even Reverend Hestick mentioned it on Sunday, that one of the greatest things that God has given to us, and sometimes we don't even realize, is our testimony. You see, because especially for the younger generation, yes, we share the word of God, but the word of God is brought to life when we share our testimony. But come on, brothers and sisters, I don't know if you're understanding me. The word of God is brought to life when we share our testimony. I have been blessed so many times and speaking to different persons that the reason why they were able to connect with God is not simply just sharing the word of God with them, but sharing God's experience, the experience of God in your own life. And, and I want to encourage us, as we are going to invite two persons to share with us this afternoon, but I want to encourage us, never hold back on our testimony. Never hold back about the full truth about your testimony. You were once this, but God has brought you here. Come on, who, who has the testimony tonight that God had the final say in their lives? Come on, brothers and sisters, who has the testimony tonight that God is a healer? Who has the testimony tonight that God is our deliverer? Who has the testimony tonight that God is the greatest physician? Who has the testimony tonight that all the other gods, they are the works of men, but you are the most high God. There is none like him. Come on, brothers and sisters. Let's give God some praise. My brothers and sisters, good night. My heart is pounding. Boop, boop, boop. 
This is the time for this testimony tonight. Praise be to God. Over 40 years ago, begin, become, explain, experience. This is my experience. For over 40 years ago, we, I was on my way to work. I was not driving at that time. So my husband, he would have taken me to work. We had two children. The girl is the first and the boy the second. We had a babysitter. Not knowing that the babysitter wasn't very kind to the little boy who we're leaving at home, the girl is going to school with us and the boy stays with the babysitter. We left the kiss that the little boy have a nice, have a good day. Just about four years. Behind with the babysitter. And our daughter is in the vehicle with us. We have left for work. Our driveway is like you're coming from Okay, they're wrong about the length of this church, the, the aisles. And you take a left turn to enter the main street. While on the main street, my husband said that he felt something and he did not know what it was. So he would have driven all this distance and then across and across and down to about the door on the main street when he finally stopped. When he stopped, there was this little boy's shirt holding on to the Jeep. We had, it was a Jeep at the time. He held it, hold on to the Jeep, and he was dragged all that way from the yard onto the main street and stayed at the second gate. When I got out of the vehicle and I saw this little boy, the entire side was, you know, when you get a burn, and it's just the raw flesh you're seeing, that was what had happened to this little boy. Immediately, we rushed, not to the hospital then, it was to Dr. Rampasad. He attended right where Ohms is attending now. And when he saw this, he said, no, this, he has to be hospitalized. This is really bad. I said, Doc, please, no, I don't want my son to go to the hospital because I said over 40 years ago, so we would have heard, known what was going on at the hospital. I do not want my son to go to the hospital. And the doctor said he must go to the hospital. I pleaded with the doctor. I said, Doc, doctor, I have a friend who is a nurse. I have a sister who is very dear to me who would help me take care. And I, I have a mother-in-law who is, and I start naming everybody who will help me to take care of this little boy and this, oh, it was awful. The doctor said, listen, okay, I've heard your plea. I'm going to give you some mercury comb. And he said, not even one Fly. Nothing is to touch any part of this, what you see here, because this is all it would be infected. 
I said, Doc, I promise we will take care. And Dr. Rampas said, believed in what I said. And he sent home this little boy, my sister. God bless my mother-in-law. There is a nurse who was um, my first daughter, my daughter's godmother. And we all, we took spell. So during the day, so I end up, started to go to work, was to have left for work. I did not go to work. So we took turns. My sister will take sometimes the night duty and I will do the day or my mother-in-law will assist and the nurse will come and do all the medical, all the things that she has to do. And God has his plan. God has kept that young boy to be a man and he has called him to serve him, to work for him in his vineyard. When he called him, his mother said, no, you cannot go. You have to go to do what you, we thought that we want you to do. That young man said, stood up. The Bible said, obey your mother, your mother and your father. But in this case, he stood up and he obeyed the Lord. And tonight, I just give God thanks for my son, Adolf, a friend, Adolf Davis. That is my experience and I give God thanks. I am grateful for the Almighty God for blessing me with a son and for keeping him until this day. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, I give you thanks for all you have done. I am so blessed, my soul is at rest, oh Lord, I give you thanks. Just before the next testimony, I just the driver of P seven three ten. Your lights are on. P seven three one zero. Your lights are on. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good; His steadfast love endures forever. And this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Good evening. Ever since I have known myself, whenever asked what I want to become, I have always said a medical doctor. I, I have always imagined it happening. However, it was not until my early years in secondary school when someone asked this question, and that's when I, see I started to think about it. The person asked, where will the funds come from? Medical school tuition is by no means minuscule, so how will my dream become a reality? My parents are farmers, with my father also being a fishmonger. It was around that same time that I heard on the news about national scholarships. So I said, yes, this must be the source. From that time onward, I prayed and I worked hard because I did not expect a scholarship to be just handed to me. I successfully completed my studies at the community college in 2016 and I was expecting a scholarship because I did well. And most of all, I heard people testifying that God answers prayers, so I was hopeful that he will answer mine. I was expecting a call at least the week before the scholarships are usually awarded around independence, but no call came. I did not lose faith because 
I did not hear anything about the scholarship in the news, so I thought, I'm still good. So the Tuesday before Independence Day, which was the Thursday, the scholarships were mentioned on the news, but no names were called. My sister called me at work to inform me, but because no names were called, she said that she was going to call the Ministry of Education. I got nervous as expected, and then she called saying that they said, I'm not one of the awardees. I was deeply saddened, but I said, not my will, O Lord, but yours be done. I went back to work, and about 10 minutes after, when the phone rang, my supervisor said that someone wants to speak to me. I was surprised and wondered who this could be because anyone who wanted to reach me usually did via my cell phone. Brothers and sisters, it was via that phone call that I received the joyful news that I was indeed an awardee. It was indeed a thrilling moment for me because it was my first time experiencing what God bestowing unto me what I earnestly prayed for. It was in that moment that I remembered Philippians 4, verse 6. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Becoming a medical doctor is definitely the will of the Lord for my life. Even now, while attending medical school, I constantly communicate with God, and He always comes through for me, whether my request is great or small. Today, I have completed two years. All praise and glory unto His name. Out of the five-year program, Getting A's, which I was told is almost impossible in medical school. But I tell you, with God, all things are possible. If it were not for him, where would I be? I honestly do not want to know because he blesses me every day. I will surely complete the five years with his help. I know the Lord and I surrender my all to him in all that I do and everywhere that I go. He is my all in all. I urge you, my brothers and sisters, to pray to the Lord in every situation, but do not only pray. You must believe that your prayers will be answered once it is his will. It is not when you want it to happen, but when he wants it to happen. As we sing in the song, and isn't it great when he's four days late, he's still on time. Our God is a faithful God. God bless you. Amen. And it, it is not by coincidence that this young lady's nickname is Blessing. Blessing and Sister Osini Lewis is her proper name, but her, she's affectionately known as Blessing, and we give God thanks for her. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. God answers prayers. 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 Hestic, no uh, embarrassment or insult is intended. 
I have in my hand a $1,000 Ghana bill, 100, five, and so on. I probably know Ghana better than you. I have in Ghana sailed one of the deepest rivers, the Pomeroon River. I have taken the boat, the speedboat, to Batica, to Essequibo, going on to Lake Kapoi, going to the quarantine. In fact, I still have paintings of the border market. I still have things from Guyana. I once offered these dollar notes to a friend and she refused them because she said she won't get much for these when she goes back to Guyana. Some of them are faded, but they are souvenirs. I am using this to say that every quarter I did five appointments. I did the Mahaika Hospital at seven, Maikoni at nine, Supply at 11. Sometimes I went on to Haidam, and I also went on to Stratcamblo and Virginia. I never knew a minister could preach five times on one Sunday. But I want to tell you, Reverend Hesty, that in Guyana, every quarter, I did five appointments. Going to the Mahaika Hospital was something else. People have been affected by leprosy. Not to the proportion of the biblical leprosy, but still you had to minister to them. It was in Guyana, Reverend Hestick, that I learned that I have the gift of exorcism because one does not know what it means to work in Guyana, to exorcise demons from people. Had I remained in Guyana also, I might have been very rich because people would come to me and say, give me uh, $50, $100, lend me some money. And when I come back from the interior, after prospecting for gold, I will give you back some gold. Ghanese are very caring. They would bring me half bag of rice half bag of flour. Working in Guyana is something else. So we appreciate your presence with us and we thank God for you and Mrs. Hesty. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot rest, rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar.
a testimony today and from four o'clock this morning I've had stomach cramps to the point where I wasn't coming to work this morning but the devil is a liar I will overcome by the word of my testimony for I know the plans I have for you plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope even before I knew Christ personally, he knew me, and he had plans for me, and he was keeping me. At the age of 11 or 12, I remember getting ready to go to school with my father, and as far as I can remember, I've never worn a seat belt. But that morning, something said to me, put on your seat belt. I was fighting with the seat belt. I couldn't get it buckled. Eventually, my father buckled it for me. About 10 minutes after we would have left home, probably just reach up hospital road there, my father had a blackout. At the same time, my uncle was overtaking him. So I guess the vehicles touched, and I remember the vehicle we were in turning over three times before it landed inches away from a pond. I know you all have rivers. We have pond, which is a body of water, and I can't swim. I am not my own. I belong to Jesus. He had a plan for me, and it did not include dying on that day. Praise the Lord. I remember also saying to a certain gentleman caller, when he mentioned his intentions, I said, I am not a pastor's wife. Not me. But I am not my own. I belong to the Lord. The Lord has shown me how much he cares for me, how much he loves me. He promises never to leave or forsake us. Through many trying times, I wondered if God was still around, but he has proven time and time again through my journey from Antigua to Jamaica, to Barbados, to St. Vincent. I have, I have seen God do incredible and impossible things in my life. 
So I am just here to encourage us, especially the young people who are uncertain that the Christian life is for you or that you can manage it. I remember saying at my first job, I don't think I can be a Christian. I like too much music and I like too much dancing. Christian life is not for me. But I'm encouraging you to trust God. Lean not on your own understanding and God will take care of the rest. Amen. Amen. And even God gave Mrs. Charles the strength to come and share with us tonight. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. 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 And so, in response to the testimonies, is there anybody like Jesus? Is there any, anyone who can compare to Jesus? And so we are going to sing the hymn, There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Let's stand. There's not a friend like the Lord is Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows, Jesus knows all about the struggle.
to your neighbor and say, no one like Jesus. No one like Jesus. Please be seated. At this time, we invite our ushers to, we will have the offering at this time. And during the taking of the offering, brother, as we see, we have a, a very large band here. This, can we give them a round of applause, the, the band? They have been blessing us wonderfully tonight. Um, and I will I mention the names to the end, but during the offering, Brother Jiran Maul on the keyboard and Brother Said Bowman on the piano will bless our hearts. Sorry, I've been just instructed the entire band will bless our hearts during the offering. Amen. We can give them another round of applause, brothers and sisters. 
And let me just call all the names on the, the panis, Sister Brianna Bergen. Yeah. We can give her a clap. Brother Said Bowman. On the drums, Brother Dion Allen. Two keyboardists, Brother Jiran Maul and Brother Ashley Cupid. And on the guitar, Brother Akil Augustus. Let's give them all a round of applause. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear God, we thank you because you have blessed us abundantly. Everything that we have belongs to you. We cannot claim rights on anything, dear God. And so, dear God, at this point, we give you back a portion of what you have given to us. We ask, O oh God, that you may receive this offering. We ask that you bless it and that it may be used for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. And dear God, help us that we will not only give of our monies, but we will give of time which you have given to us and our talents which you also have given to us. Just as how this band has given their time and talents here this afternoon. I ask a special blessing upon them, dear God, that you may continue to guide them and bless them and that they may be set apart for you for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We now turn to the word of God and we will now have the scripture reading which will be done by Brother Harris Stapleton. Good night, everyone. We have two readings tonight, but our first reading is taken from Romans chapter 12, reading verses 3 to 9. Romans 12, 3 to 9. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in measuring, in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Our second reading is Acts Acts chapter 1 and verse 13. Acts 1 verse 13. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas son of James. These are the words of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I now invite Reverend Adolf Davis to introduce our guest preacher. And his name is? But you're not saying as if you know the man's name. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Marlon 
Heswick, Hesnick, eh? Hestick, Hestick, Hestick. Brother Monty last night, this might have to go down a slide, brother, um, brother Ken. Brother Monty last night was talking about how some persons called him Mali, Maul, um, and all kinds of fancy renditions. I suspect uh, Reverend Hestick has had some very interesting experiences with his name as well. And so Reverend Dr. Marlon Hestick, as most of you would know, if we have anybody here for the first time, is from Guyana, the Vreden Hoop Wesleyan Church. He's here uh, with his wife, Sister Jacinta. I then in welcomed her. I just I know she welcomed her, but stand and make sure they see who was welcomed. Yeah, so this is so we have at least three marvels in the church tonight. So Sister Marva Hestick, and we had two marvels stewards who were collecting the offering, and we might have other marvels here. So we are certainly blessed with marvels in the church tonight. And um, and so Reverend Hestick uh, has. Um, been engaged in ministry and effectively so in ministry for several years at, at Reed and Hoop in particular and has really been very rich in his reflection on God's word and and very honest about the word of God and, and the ministry that God has called him to um, share. We are glad and we really thank God that we can benefit from it here in St. Vincent um, whenever he comes, he really leaves us with something of value, of stunts, something to, to work with and walk with. Last night, he reminded us that even though perish is in the boat, what else is in the boat too? Power. So you have to decide whether you let perish perish the boat or power rescue the boat. Are you with me? So it's either perish or power. And the question was, what is, who is, sorry, in the boat? Who is in your boat? And so we look forward to what God is going to lay on his heart this evening. And so I want us to just give him, before we, he comes, we're going to sing. But let's just put our hands together and give him a rousing expression of appreciation. Hack. The gospel news is sounding Christ has suffered on the tree. Streams of mercy are abounding. Grace for all is rich and free. Verse 3 is, is of particular importance. I've always found verse 3 to be very special. Grace is flowing like a river. Millions there have been supplied. Still it flows as fresh as ever. From the Savior's wounded side. None need perish. None need perish. All may live for Christ has died. Come, let me sing this thing. It's not bad for this song. So let me sing it like it's a real, you know. Come on, let's stand and sing together. Pa, 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 pa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At the gospel news is sounding, Christ had suffered on the tree. Bum, bum, bum. Streams of mercy are abounding, grace for all is rich and free. Bum, bum, bum. No mercy, no, no mercy. Hosanna, now Hosanna, look to him who died for thee. Come on, let's sing. Oh, escape to yonder mountain, now begin to watch and pray. Christ invites, Christ invites you to the fountain, come and wash your sins up. Do not tarry, 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 come to Jesus while you 
special meetings and we invite a guest speaker who comes in from another country, another culture. Our human side can be distracted by those things, Lord. And yet, in your wisdom, you have determined that every joint in the body supplies. We don't know how you do it, but tonight I ask that you would supply to the need of these people through the deliberations, the revelations, and the manifestations of your spirit. Speak into hearts. It is our tendency, Lord, to process in our head first and then decide if we would allow your truth to get to our heart. But I pray tonight that your word will be written on the flesh of every heart. That we would do like David said, thy word have I hid in my heart. We've had many good revivals. We remember some from the past. We celebrate messages that stirred our hearts, touched us. But tonight, we need an experience. You've used the musicians powerfully. You've caused us to hear your spirit through the songs. The testimonies have caught our attention. Now it's our turn to respond. To respond to what you use them to say to us. To respond to what your spirit is being saying to us day by day. And so God, we sit, we stand before you today as though this is the final act of the Parliament of Heaven in this place. As though for this week and this time and this season, you are, Lord, declaring to your people in the kingdom of God what you would have them hear and how you'd have them be. And I pray that every soul would be subject to the King immortal, invisible, the only wise God, to whom be glory 
and power and dominion and authority now and forevermore. Amen and amen. We have two contrasting texts that we're working tonight. And the texts were given to us by the Spirit of God to speak on the blessing of the ordinary. It's a different theme. It's an unusual theme, but it fits right smack into the middle of God's will for us as a people. The blessing of the ordinary. I was transfixed tonight when Sister Davis testified about the path that God used to give us his servant who takes responsibility for this house and for the Methodist Church in this nation. What she didn't tell us, but what I've understood from listening to her and her son and her husband, is that they have been an ordinary people living in a fairly ordinary house, doing the ordinary task of farming and teaching. Ordinary gave us Reverend Davis. In your mind, come with me and let's walk through the door at the back. As I did the first time I came, and go to the tombstones just outside. fascinating thing none of those tombstones carry the title the status the importance of any one of those who departed having served the Methodist Church it's almost as though when we leave here death restores us to ordinary That all of this clamoring for status and importance, significance and title pales because creation has to respond to creator. We are celebrating Alders Gate. And in order to appreciate Alders Gate, we have to consider ordinary in John Wesley's life. A branch. from the burning ordinary 18 children hmm. the house was on fire and he was trapped and somebody pulled him out went to Cambridge did his master's degree was ministering in the Anglican church and God touched his heart and in Aldous Gate he was strangely warmed on the inside he got saved and what did God do with this man God sent him to the ordinary which ordinary people in the pubs the coal miners the wretched of the earth the people amazingly for whom the gospel gives hope but to whom the church of the day didn't have its eyes focused. Alders Gate was about reaching the ordinary. God picked on a man and took him to ordinary people. There was a revival in England and it started among the ordinary people. When the circuits were established, suddenly people who had no relationship with Cambridge University, who couldn't walk into the hallowed hallways of the Anglican Church and other arrangements, they were stewards 
And they were helping and supporting John Wesley. Ordinary men and women were suddenly important in the purposes of God. And because of ordinary men and women, the gospel took off from a nation blighted by sin to bring hope to the rest of the world. There is power in the purposes of God when he puts his hand on ordinary. But we have a resident contradiction these days that there is pressure, even in the church, for people to measure and to give value to the importance of each other based on their status, based on the size of the house, based on the car that we drive. In fact, I've gone places where, in a particular country in the Caribbean, where they told me when I sent a three-line introduction of myself, they said this is inadequate for our purposes. We don't introduce men and women to the pulpit to preach anymore as pastors or ministers. They've got to be a mighty man of God. I've been to the United States and I've been amazed walking down Brooklyn and other places where when you look and what's represented on the outside of the building, you will see a name, and then you will see founder, bishop, doctor, reverend, chief, apostle. And I've observed that when you see a lot of titles, people are trying to make an impression and to demand a certain attention even before they deliver anything. That content is not as important anymore a status. I am here tonight to tell you that there is a blessing in the ordinary. And the two passages of scripture speak to that issue. Ordinary. I shared with you last night and the night before about some of our challenges as a family. My mother was this 15 year old girl who didn't finish, never went to high school. She never went to high school. When you're 15 and pregnant out of wedlock, you're not supposed to produce a child who's a preacher. She wasn't in church. She wasn't a Methodist, she wasn't a pilgrim, she wasn't an Anglican. She wasn't a believer, she wasn't saved, she wasn't going to church. But the purposes of God overrule the circumstances of men. So that no matter where you started in life, in the purposes of God, every person has destiny. That is why even when a woman gets pregnant out of wedlock, the child still belongs to God. The father may not sign for the child. Society may reject the child and the mother, as happened to me. But the purposes of God are greater than the tragedies of men. In fact, it is like God to cause out of death life to come. So that Jesus says, except a grain of wheat falls into the ground and what? Dies. Except there is so much loss and you look at it and you're thinking, that's not fair. And then God, being God, brings life out of it. Tonight I'm here to encourage your hearts that none of us is anything more than ordinary people. Given the favor of God that allows us to live sometimes above where some others live. But bottom line, we're all ordinary. I want you to come with me as I go through these scriptures and I share some things from the Word of God. I want us to be very deliberate, very specific. I know it's revival and I know that some people expect me to come and spit fire. And maybe I will as the Lord empowers me. But I want you to walk with substance tonight as you go away. Amen? Now, let's begin at the top. Let's ask the question, how do people grow and become 
is our beginning and our becoming because of what's outside of us or because of what's inside of us? It's an important question. I spoke to a young man today and I asked him, in five years, what's going to happen to your life? Where are you going to be? He said to me, oh, in five years, I'll be. And he told me what would happen in his life. The assumption that he was making is that his destiny was tied up to opportunities in some good far land. He's thinking just like I explained earlier, that a lot of people are pressured, even in church, to measure success by accomplishments, external things. From birth, God contradicts that because God places our destiny inside of us. Everything that I was going to be was deposited by God inside of me. My ability to declare the gospel, my ability to understand, God placed it inside of me. Now he's going to arrange certain human circumstances outside to get this thing out of me. But every human being called ordinary starts with the same thing. Everything that God wants you to be is where? Inside. You pick up a seed, it's embryo, it's baby is where? Inside. If it's an American seed, it's the same principle. If it's a Guyanese seed, it's the same principle. If it's a Vincentian seed, it's the same principle. That is why many years ago when my family, some have migrated and they said, well, we, are you interested in migrating so you could have a good chance to go to North America and have the good life? And I said, no. And they couldn't understand. And I said, the reason I can tell you no is because I understand that what God wants to do with my life doesn't have to do with where I'm located all I have to do is know what God wants and God is going to make the moves to my life. I don't have to go to a better place to have a better life. No, no, don't stone me, please. It's a challenge in the church. It's a challenge. In the natural, everybody's thinking, well, you know, I have to take care of my family. I have to do this. I have to do that. I've raised three children, my wife and I, and I've been in the ministry all the time, preaching the gospel, and God is taking care of every one of them. We don't have debts, we don't have bills, because God has taken care. Am I making sense yet? I want you to hear me, especially the young ones, I want you to hear me. We overlook the blessing of the ordinary to emphasize external evidence so that people could recognize us. That is why you will see so many manifestations of physicality these days everybody's trying to create an impression of uniqueness unique ear style unique dress code unique standards of walking people are doing all kinds of crazy things so that when you look at them they are different uniqueness but our destiny is where inside everything god created carries its future within itself the seed is a forest waiting to emerge no seed is ordinary even though the coconut is bigger. Than the apple seed. The coconut tree is not better. Every seed has the same potential. The manifestation of the potential is different. But they carry the same principle of what? Potential. I'm talking to people tonight. My mother tells me that she cries these days because out of that premarital arrangement where she had many children early in life, by the time she was 33 years, she had 10 children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ten children in 17 years. And the majority of them are serving the Lord. Now hold, 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 hold. It's not supposed to be. Because if you start outside of church without God, then you're supposed to end up outside of God, outside of church. But that's the principle. You see, see, God is so amazing that no matter how your life is all messed up and your generational past is all messed up, grace rescues every single person. 
That is why destiny is not tied in to being important. It's tied in to a purpose that God has set over every life. Go ahead. Maximize your skills. Do well with your talent. But remember, promotion doesn't come from the east. It doesn't come from the west. Men can offer you job elevation, but promotion, spiritual things that God respects, they can only come from God himself. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? Now, the same principle pertains to your life. In Psalms 139, verse 16, David testifies, Your eyes saw my own formed body. And then he said this, All the days of my life were written when as yet there was none. God wrote every single day of your life. Whatever you're trying to accomplish, God has written. Psalms 139 verse number 16. God has written every single day. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. And yet the steps of a righteous man are what? Ordered. So there is a way that seemeth right. A man can make his own way. But there is a pattern. God says, if you trust me, the steps of a righteous man will line up with what I've written for your life. For your life. So, let's talk about the church. This brings us to Romans chapter 12. I like the Methodist church because you have so many opportunities to serve. Stewards and workers and liturgists and all kinds of opportunities to serve. I like the Wesleyan church because similarly you have so many opportunities to serve. But I've, I've seen something that I want to address tonight, and it is this, that a lot of people in the body of Christ are like, what happens at a cricket match? There are 11 people fielding, there are two umpires officiating, and there are two men batting. 11 and 2 and 2, that's 15. And there are 15,000 people in the stands sitting down watching those 11 and the other two the umpires don't run they watch them run up and down and tell them what to do but it is a stupid stroke church has become like that every year we elect an 11 and a 2 and another 2 who bat and if they're not making runs, we change the batsmen. <laughs> I got to speak in political terms now. Y'all talk to me. While the rest of the church sits down and talks about how many matches it has been to and observed. And those people are the ordinary people that God wants to speak to. Listen to me. Listen tonight. Hear the word of God. Romans chapter 12 verse 3. God tells us not to think more highly of ourselves. That's the first part. Then he says three things in verse 4 to verse 9. Number one. He said he has given us gifts to the entire body. Everybody gets something. So whether you are a steward. Whether you are the reverend. Whether you are without title. Everybody has something from God. There is a blessing that he has given to the ordinary. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? Secondly, all the gifts in the ministries, great and small, are called to pay attention to doing the same thing. All the ministries, whether you have a title of a preacher or a title of a singer or a title of whatever, everybody's doing the same thing, to give God glory. Do you know that there's no statement in the Bible that shows that ministers of the gospel will get better blessings than regular brethren who walk with Jesus Christ? There's no such respecter of persons by God. You do what God wants, God blesses you for doing it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But it goes further. Here's the third thing that it says. Romans chapter 12, 9 to 11. It says, in honor, preferring one another. 
Hmm. In honor, respecting even ordinary, those who seem to be less than you. Hmm. Then we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to listen to me tonight before I get to Acts chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 22 to 25, here's what it says. It's talking about the body again. And Paul says, I'm writing these things to clear up ignorance in the body. He's talking about the function of the body. And here's what we're told. We are told that whatever God has given to the body is to profit everybody. So the cleaner profits the entire church. Hello? When we have revival, we focus on the person in the pulpit. But we couldn't sit in the sanctuary if the cleaner didn't take care of the seats. When the Spirit of God moves and touches my heart, that is also because somebody took the time to clean the sanctuary. When we do appreciation services, I have never been in a church where the cleaner was appreciated. Our appreciation is always for the minister or some long serving brother or sister or something. But I ask you, please come and worship in a dirty church. And then you realize you can't do it. So God clarifies to us that you must give honor. Somebody say honor. Again, he says to us these four things out of, these three things out of 1 Corinthians. Number one, he says the feeble, those who appear feeble are necessary. Nobody wants to be the cleaner, but the cleaner is what? The blessing of the ordinary. Secondly, verse 23. And those parts of the body which we think are less honor, unto these we bestow more abundant honor. That's a contradiction. The blessing of the ordinary is that the Bible teaches that in this house, things that you don't really give a lot of value to, those things invariably are used more. I've been in your house for a few days, Rev. You have some nice furniture and God bless you. I like the cane chairs. I thank God for it. But you know what I use the most? The cups and the spoons. Nobody remembers who made the spoon. We only use those chairs once in every blue moon. But we always use the spoon. But the spoon, when visitors come, they don't celebrate our spoons. They celebrate our furniture. Oh, you have lovely furniture here. But we don't really use them. In the kingdom, God says this. Please, verse 23. Those parts of the body which we think are less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. One of the things that we have to do in the body of Christ is look at brothers and sisters whose names you don't know. Reach across the aisle and start to shake their hands. Brother, sister, God bless you. People who just come to sit and be part of the service. But every time we have a service, they are there. They make the effort to come. They never come to the stage. They never do anything. They never come to the altar area. But they are here. And we need to recognize them and honor them. Who turns off the lights in the church? Who locks up the building? Who secures the place? Who makes sure that the parking lot is okay? Who takes care of the toilets? I went to the largest church in the world in Korea, in Seoul, Korea. It's the Yoida Full Gospel Church where Yonggi Cho is a pastor. It has 750,000 members. So as part of my training, I went there and I spent a month looking at some of the things they're doing in Korea. And I learned an amazing thing that anybody who wants to serve in the ministry, anybody, no matter who you are, your first place of service is in the children's bathroom, the little children's bathroom. Where children have their accidents. Grown men. Taking care of stuff. Then they put you in the traffic. The service is approximately 45,000 people are in the building. So every time a service is done, you have 45,000 going out and 45,000 coming in. And you have to manage that traffic. You have to pass the test of serving as ordinary. 
before you can go anywhere else. Thirdly, in 25, it says that our acceptance of the ministry of the ordinary is critical to our relationships with one another. Paul says that there should be no schism, no division. Look at there. The members may have the same care. I discovered one time that if you were to ask for an offering for the organist, you're likely going to get a bigger offering than if you were to ask for the brother at the back who had an accident yesterday. You know why? Because we are respecters of status. I'm talking to us tonight. And so, Marvin Davis, the question is, is there a place for the ordinary after all of that? In the Bible, God uses a lot of ordinary people to accomplish amazing things for him. One of my favorite persons is a man called Obed-Edom. The ark had been away with the Philistines for many, many years. And when David became king, thank God, they got back the ark and they were going to take the ark up to where it should be. But David made a mistake. He made a cart, put the ark on a cart. And while they were moving across the threshing floor, the ark shook and a man named Uzzah put out his hand. And the Bible says that God killed him for touching the ark. He shouldn't have done that. It was against the law. David got upset with God because he thought he was doing a good thing for God and for the kingdom. And he took the ark and he just basically pushed it away to a man's house. The man's name was Obed-Edom. The man was a porter. He was a what? A porter, somebody who fetches load. Ordinary man. The ark was left in Obed-Edom's house for three months. And the Bible says that while it was there, God blessed that man. You know why? Because as a porter, he understood how to care for valuable things. When you're a porter and you know that fetching from here to there is important, that you couldn't drop the goods, that your job, your future depends on your ability to maintain the weight, maintain the posture, so you don't damage what you're carrying. When that thing, that ordinary thing that you've been doing all the time that nobody respects, God now uses it to care for the ark. And the Bible says God blesses that man's house for three months. And then something happens. When you check Obed-Edom's life afterwards, you will find that out of his line, God raised up the treasurer of the kingdom and great men and women of the kingdom of God. One ordinary man. Using his skill for the work of God. Got a generational blessing that shifted the fortunes of his generation. I'm going to stay here for a little bit. Remember Naaman? Anybody? Naaman? Captain of the Syrian army. Mighty man of God. No? He wasn't a man of God. He was a warrior. He was a fighter. And he had leprosy. Leprosy. And he wanted to be healed. So he sent for the man of God. He wanted the man of God to come out of his house to give him a word. The man of God didn't come out of his house. The man sent a word and told him, go to Jordan River and dip. You know what he did? The scripture says he got angry. Because Jordan River had a reputation for being a, 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 a place that carried sewage and some other stuff. He got mad. Listen now. The Bible says that when he went home, an unnamed servant girl, a maid, an ordinary non-entity of a woman, was used by God. No name is recorded. But the miracle of Naaman's healing took place because an ordinary girl told him, if the prophet said, go do it. You have nothing to lose. Just go there and do it. We talked about a testimony tonight. 
One of the things that ordinary people have that they must use more often is the power of encouragement. One of the things that we need, that I need in the ministry, that I've seen men and women of God suffer from, is the lack of encouragement coming from people. You don't have to preach, you don't have to sing a song, you don't have to bring a gift just to say, Rev, thank you for that word. Rev, thank you for coming to work today. Because whether Rev is strong or weak, he got to come to the office. Because he's Rev. If he doesn't come to the office, whether he's strong or weak, the people Rev up. Anybody remembers Gideon? Gideon was from the weakest tribe. And God called him, mighty man! The angel he turned around and said, who are you talking to? Not me. When it was time for the battle, a whole set of men turned up. 32,000 plus. God said, it can't work. I don't want them. 22 went back. God said, when the 10,000 remain, I don't want them. 10,000 went back. 300 men. He was, was used by God to fight against the enemy. What was the employment of those men, those 300 men? They were farmers. 300 farmers under God took on an army of skilled soldiers. And ordinary farmers under the anointing and leadership of the spirit of the living God destroy those soldiers. There is a blessing in ordinary when it's in the hand of God. Because ordinary transforms when it's in the hand of an extraordinary God. And we can go on. Amos. Here's what he says. He says, I was not a prophet. Nor was I the son of a prophet. Rather, I was a herdsman and a bender or a, 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 a planter, sorry, of sycamore trees. But the Lord took me from following the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Mary, how old was she? Depending on who you read, she was somewhere between 15 and 17. Hail Mary! I had the privilege of going to Israel and going to the house, the traditional place where Mary's house was supposed to have been. It's a little space. It's not bigger than this space here. It's very small. Ordinary. Poor. And God picked on poor. And the Bible says one day she conceived by the work of the Holy Ghost and she got her babe where? Now give me the modern day word for manger. A cow pen. Huh? She got her baby where? In a cow pen. Now you know if your son comes to you and say mom dad you know we had some trouble so the, my wife you know we, we had to stop at a cow pen. There's no glory in that. Watch this. Who did she give birth to? When they saw him, they called him a carpenter. His trade, Jesus' trade on the earth was carpentry. In terms of human ranking and standing, he was ordinary. And we can go on and on and on and make the point. There has to be a shift in our perspective. We are not the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Listen to me. I am not saying to you that God doesn't want us to do well secularly. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we have to remain ordinary in order for God to elevate us. If we humble ourselves, God will exalt us. If we see our value as being only in God and not in the secular structures, we are in the right place with God. There's been so much fighting. I've told brethren... We have a problem. Somebody is in the world and they're, they're skilled in finances and we have a vacancy in the church. We, try, we bring that person straight on a straight line. From world, straight to church. And the first qualifications for service in church is not skill, it's character. We 
But we do that all the time. We want to hear a teacher. We pick somebody who will serve. No, we're not looking first at what they're doing with Christ. We bring in ordinary. So, this brings us to the text we read in Acts chapter 1. If my brother could put it up. It's a funny text. It doesn't make any sense until you see a name in it. The blessing of the ordinary. Acts chapter 1 verse 13. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs. I went to that room in Israel, the upper room. It's a little space where the 120 were gathered. Where they were staying, Peter and John and James. And who else? Andrew. Now don't read the rest. We're stopping at Andrew. You know stories about Peter. You know stories about John. You know that James became superintendent. You know Philip preached. You know Thomas was a doubter. You know Bartholomew and Matthew. They had different names and so on. But who exactly was Andrew? Ordinary. I want to bring the message together by pointing out the blessing of this man's life to the body of Christ. I want to give you some hope tonight. That anytime God is moving, when you look in the scriptures, there, there's always a record of somebody who doesn't amount to a whole lot among men. When Jesus is going up to the cross, going up to Golgotha Hill to the cross to die, for, uh, 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 to the hilltop to die on the cross for our sins, and the weight of the cross was too much for him, they pulled the man out from the crowd. He lived in North Africa. Let's pull him out. North Africa. I'm going to say something here. Don't fuss with me. It is true. North Africa. Years later, we will learn that the reasons people went down, the reason people went down to Africa was to exploit the strength of those people who lived there. Grace took the strength of people, somebody from Africa, to bring salvation to the rest of the world through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Don't despise anybody. Andrew, the word, the name Andrew means manly. Andrew and his brother Peter grew up with an uncle they didn't grow up with their parents from the history and so it is possible that they could have been dysfunctional we don't know all the factors why they lived with their uncle for a season but they could have been dysfunctional and what do we find the scripture telling us about this man Andrew it tells us some things that I want you to learn tonight there are five and I'll give you them and then shut up We learn that Andrew had a passion for truth. Ordinary man. When he's introduced to us, he's not following Jesus, he's following John the Baptist. John the Baptist preached a message of repentance. And an ordinary man heard the message and went after John the Baptist. And then one day, John the Baptist said, Behold, the love of God. That take it away the sins of the world. And Andrew moved from John the Baptist to spend a day with Jesus. And then when he spent that day, he got the revelation this was the Messiah. And what did he do? He went and he called his own brother. Said, is this not the Christ? The ordinary man. This wasn't the preacher. Hello somebody. This man didn't go to any Bible school ordinary but he's running after truth andrew was also very diligent when 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 jesus called andrew andrew was not liming andrew was not just bemoaning his circumstances i'm nothing in the world you know my life is not a mountain giant thing he was a fisherman diligently working at the sea of galilee that's where we got the song from he dropped his net and followed christ diligent one of the things about poverty and lack and being in that kind of situation is that 
Sometimes laziness is the reason why one continues to be there. Laziness. What do we learn from this man? John 1, 41. He finds Simon his brother and brings him to Christ. Andrew introduced Peter who would preach at Pentecost. Who would write two of the books. Who would be the one that God used to open the door to the ministry to the Gentiles. An ordinary man brought Peter to Jesus. What kind of man did he bring to Jesus? Jesus looked at the man and said, you're shifty. You have a problem. You're not stable yet, but you will become a rock. You'll become a rock. The power of the influence of the ordinary is that you don't even know what God will do with what you bring to him. I look back at my own life. My own life. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm thinking, God, you're so good. The people that influence me, none of them sit in some of the places and the boards and whatever where I sit. And I'm not boasting. I'm just saying that it is like God to use ordinary people to promote other people to higher places. It's an amazing grace in the kingdom of God. I remember when we were pioneering our first church way out in the countryside in Mahaika. Where's my brother? In Mahaika. We were there in Mahaika. The Methodist church was right up the road. And my wife and I were there. And there's this little old woman who is cooking for us. Sometimes when she cooks, it's not well cooked. I had some bad food experiences. But I look back now and realize that God used that woman to feed me to become what I am today. I'm in church. Pilgrim Holiness Church, and in our culture, we used to go to the throne of grace. I don't know how many of you remember that. We used to approach the throne of grace, and you had to kneel down. We would kneel down to talk with God. A part of the service, everybody would get on the floor, and you put your head on that seat, and you start to pray. And I was one of the holiest members of the church. I didn't know that. When I knelt down, the sisters realized how holy I was. After the service, they came together and they pulled their money and they gave me enough money to buy a pair of shoes because I was so holy. Yeah, some of you believe it was other things. <laughs> Those ladies, listen to me, were like some of us here. They were ordinary women. Some of them were widows. But they took their widow's might to put it together to buy a pair of shoes for me. Not knowing that their investment as ordinary women whose names are nowhere in the church would empower somebody to become a preacher for the glory of Almighty God. Those were the first shoes anybody bought for me. They were bought for me in the church. I've learned something about ordinary. Poor people could identify poor people. <laughs> it's true. You know the signs. You know the smells. To this day, I can know when food was cooked on an outside wood fire. I grew there. You know what I'm talking about? And, and, and God uses that, your experience, to build compassion for other people with similar experience. Never despise your beginnings. Never turn back from where God used you, started you. Because there's something there that somebody else will need. And when those women saw me, they saw me. My father wasn't in church. My mother wasn't in church. I was the only youth man. I was the only young man in the church. Only, only, only.
Secondly, Andrew. John 6, 1 to 13. One day Jesus is preaching and he preaches and guess what happens? The people stay with him and they're hungry. The question is asked, how do we feed them? Remember? And Andrew is the one who said, Jesus told them, you go, sorry. Andrew said, hold on, hold on. There's a youth man here, there's a boy here and he has some loaves and fishes, Andrew. Even the apostles, the ministers of the gospel, didn't have the solution. An ordinary man saw something and he said, we got some bread. Say with me, solution. Say it again. The solution didn't come from the top. Where did it come from? It came from the bottom. One of the things we have to learn in church is to be able to receive because every joint, every joint supplies. Don't sit believing that because you don't have status, you can't contribute to the work of God. God will give you insights and understanding and revelation that you can bring to solve the problems of how to meet people's need. Thousands of people got fed in a difficult situation because Andrew saw the solution. Number three. John chapter 12, 20 to 22. Jesus is ministering. And while he's ministering, there's a message that comes. Greek men had showed up at the ministry. St. Vincent and Venezuelans, they said, were outside the door of the church. Different language, different culture. Greek men had heard about Jesus and they were there. They were there because there was a barrier, it was a cultural barrier. The Jews didn't mingle with them. Though they had the mandate from God to take the gospel, the Jews had built walls, cultural walls of elitism around themselves. We are the ones going to heaven. God sent Jesus to break down the walls of partition. Yes or no? That's what he did. Andrew sees those men out there. You know what he does? He's the one that takes their hands. And he brings them to Jesus. He walks them past the barriers of culture. I'm talking to you. When I turn up with my jacket and my suit, and I walk through the streets of Georgetown, the young people part. They know it's rev coming. When my son walks in with his jeans, God forbid, with his boss of pants, and he pulls over to them and he touches flesh. They want to talk to him. There's some of us, because of our calling, we cannot any longer vibes with people of a certain level. Not because we don't want to, but because our mandate and our requirement puts us at a different plane. Do you understand? But God always maintains a cadre of ordinary people so they can touch ordinary people. Who is going to cause this generation to come into the kingdom of God? These are young people, these musicians. I'm sitting there listening to them playing. I'm thinking, last night was Cupid. Now I'm taking the whole band together. You know? I'm telling you. I'm listening to you. They're asking you to clap for them after they finish playing. I'm thinking, you don't get it. You haven't seen the value of what you have. Don't get so accustomed to the good thing that you stop applauding it. Right now, let's give a belated applause for the music. I mean, a real clap your hand, make some nice applause. I'll tell you why it's important. Just recently, we had a problem. One of the best guitarists in the country is in our church. He's a young man. He's 21 years of old. He's at university. A couple of years ago, his father left. He's a sailor and went to sea and never came back. Nobody knows what happened to him. He is officially dead. While his father is out, his mother died. He's about eight or nine coming to the church. And the church basically took him over. He, along with my son and another young man, they sleep at the church. Every single night, they're there. They're studying at the church. They're at university together. Well, our world carnival was last year, uh, March. And I'm sitting home 
watching the news and they're giving a slip of the carnival and there is my guitarist at the back what so I I got to the music uh, director and I said something is wrong and when they talked with him here's what they found out daddy dead mama dead auntie them can't feed him he needs money You know what we did? Rev, we sat down as a board and we found money to pay him a salary every month so he doesn't have to go anywhere to carry his musical skill. He's employed by the church. Why? Hold on, the story is not the employment. The story is that he is a cultural bridge between the church and the next generation. He's an orphan. He's ordinary, but he's powerful for God. Two more and then we're done. Yeah, just two. Mark chapter 13. Verses 3 and 4. <laughs> it's a powerful verse. Can you throw it up for me? Verse 3, verse 4. I want you to see this. Mark 13. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, this is Jesus sitting. What happened? Four of the 12 disciples cornered him privately. Three of them are going to become ministers of the gospel, but one continues to be a layman, ordinary. In the midst of a company of ministers curious about truth, and prophecy sits a brother named Andrew. And what is he doing? He is asking questions even and straight with the ministers about what would happen in the end. I've been preaching the gospel for a while and one of the things that blesses my heart is when people who are not ministers come and say, Pastor, you said so and so this morning. What does that mean? Rev, you, you, you were teaching last week, Wednesday, on so and so. I didn't quite understand. Could I come to your office so we could sit and work through some of the things? Men and brethren, there is power in your ability to represent the gospel to people at your level. I believe there's no greater influence than a man being able to testify to his friend. Typically in church, we say, Hold on, I will bring my reverend to talk with you. You don't have to bring the reverend. You can know enough of the word like Andrew to be able to share it with somebody in the name of Jesus. But you got to learn that the blessing of the ordinary will only be transmitted if you sit at Jesus' feet. And then finally this one. Acts chapter 1 verse 13. That's where we started. What is that text about? It's about Pentecost. The world is going to be changed. The world is going to be changed. Fire is going to come down from heaven. The Holy Spirit is going to move. There's going to be fire upon heads. Hearts will be purified. The burning out of dross. Spiritual holiness will be established in the earth. In a permanent way because no longer will you have to do rituals but by the spirit of god and man a purity will be seen among men that was never seen before the bible tells us as it gives the record number one peter number two john number three the fourth man in the list is andrew Stay with me. Imagine with me. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, verse number 1, it says, And Peter standing. The man that God used to preach was who? Peter. Who was standing behind Peter? Andrew. What was Andrew doing? Standing in amazement. That the man that he had invited was now being used by God 
To preach to whom? To the nations under the heaven, according to the record of Acts. There were a multiplicity. There was a multiplicity of nations gathered under the heaven at Pentecost in Jerusalem. And the man that Andrew had invited to meet Jesus was preaching the first international message of the gospel. You know who was there? Read the text. It says from Arabia, Bin Laden's great, great, great grandfather was at that place. Those people that you were afraid of, the gospel was released into the community. The Bible speaks of a bringing in of Ishmael's line. And it began because God was prepared to use the man that Andrew brought. There's no limit to what God will do with somebody that you and I bring to him. I'm listening to Sister Davis tonight. I'm thinking, I didn't know that story. And all I'm seeing is this little boy in my mind, four years old. He pans down thing off. Sanctified imagination, right? I am thinking that the shirt should have torn off of his body and he should have fallen onto the road and the back wheel of the van should have run over his four-year-old body. <laughs> A farmer and a teacher gave us a reverend. Hold, hold, don't clap, don't clap yet, don't clap yet. Come, I got some question for us. Will you give in? Who told you that you have nothing to give because you don't have status? I want you tonight to identify two persons. Two. How many? That you know you can talk with. You already know. I can I can I can tell them my story. I can bring them to I can tell them about Jesus. When you have your two, raise your hand, let me see. As soon as you've identified your two, put up your hand. I'm seeing one hand. I hope it's going to be more than one. Let me, let me slow it down. If you can identify two persons, could you please raise your hand? Because I'm going to pray with all of us. It's going somewhere. Two persons that you can share with. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Two persons. Two persons. Father, my brothers and sisters, called by any ordinary, in your hand become extraordinary for your glory. Speak through them to their ordinary friends, their ordinary relatives, their ordinary peers on the job for your glory. In Jesus' name. I want to thank you tonight, Rev and team, for the invitation to have my wife and I here. We continue the ministry, but I may not see all of you. Tomorrow night it's the youth, and the next two nights we're on the road. So I may not see you. I want to thank all of you for your prayers. Today I ate dashin. Rev didn't cook it. Rev, give me dashin drink. What do you call that drink? Dashin what? Dashin punch. That's what Rev gave me. Yeah. 
and it had a punch. <laughs> I want to thank you for the hospitality, the care, the prayers, the support. When I told my wife I was coming here, she insisted she had to come. She has been challenged. She has a little condition in her leg. But she's been here, and we have enjoyed these sessions with you. I want to say one final thing. When, when, your, when your leaders organize special meetings, it's not for you to have a nice time. There's a record of what happened here before God. Every time God brings the word to us, it's for us to change, come in line with his will. Do not, even if you didn't raise your hand or any such thing, didn't come to you all, do not walk out of here the same person. You don't have to agree with the preacher and everything he says in every illustration, but God is faithful that by his spirit, he speaks to every heart. Whatever the Lord has said to you, do it. Can I pray with you tonight? Stand with me and let me pray with you. Father, we thank you tonight for these folks. King, Stone, Methodist, and all the others, brothers and sisters from this great country, who've gathered here these nights and during Sunday to remember Alders Gate and to be inspired by Alders Gate. When they were planning, they called it revival. The assumption, dear God, was that there was a need for men and women to be stirred by the Spirit of God, that the fire of God would flow from their lives better than it was flowing at the time they were planning. And dear God, we cannot judge people. We don't even know how to assess the heart. At best, we can only look on the outward appearance. But we know your ways, O oh God. Your word says your ways, your ways, O oh God. You speak to the heart. And I believe tonight that you have spoken to my brothers and my sisters as you have spoken to my wife and I. And I pray God at this house and the work in the Methodist church in this country, O oh God, that there will be a revival befitting what you have done during these sessions. That leaders, pastors, ministers, O oh God, those who have responsibility for preaching and declaring your truth will be fired up by the Spirit of God. The people will be fired up. There will be growth in the churches. Salvation will take place. People who have been doing, living their lives contrary to righteousness and outside of the ambit of your grace. They will recognize that they are living wrong and will bow to the claims of Jesus and be restored. I pray for people, God, who have many, many years just sat in the church and thought, well, I'm just waiting for my day to come to an end. Well, I'll go to be with Jesus. I pray, God, that you will cause a revival among the ordinary. Let there be a movement in the church, in the Methodist church, where ordinary people, oh God, will be raised up to be used by you. I pray for the young ones, oh God, the next generation. Lord, they're the ones to break down some of these cultural barriers. They're the ones to interpret the music. They're the ones to understand why our young people are not even coming into the church. They hear the reasons. We don't know. We pontificate from the pulpit. We say things. We do assessments and all of that. But they are part of that crowd. They understand the culture. We pray that the ordinary ones, the ones that we don't even pay attention to, that you will give them a burden in their heart to reach their hands out to the Greeks. To bring them to Jesus. Cause. That the young people of this movement. Oh God. The Methodist movement in St. Vincent. Will become an example. To the rest. Oh God. Of the region. I pray for men. We've seen the sisters. And we thank you for them. But I pray for men. It has been your. Your way, God, to call men and to touch men and to speak to men. For men to lead, for men to give direction. To men to bow to the claims of Christ. For men to take up office, for men to take up the ministry, for men to obey you. I pray for men. I pray for men who will 
God be willing to go beyond their differences in perspective and understanding and even expectations. Oh God, and just agree that this is the will of God. I pray for men that they will hold hands, they will support each other, they will lift up each other. Men who are praying men, men who will hear from the Spirit of God, men who will serve sacrificially. I pray for men. I pray for men, oh God. I pray for men. The tradition of the Methodist church has always been that there have been grown men, good men standing and pushing. Raise up men, oh God. I pray for healing, God, among relationships where they're broken and struck with all kinds of, of, of experiences where people say, well, because this happened to me, I can't move forward. Heal the relationships tonight. Break down the walls of partition. I pray for every minister. I pray for the minister and his family. I pray for the minister and their children. Dear God, if there's any child belonging to any minister in the Methodist circuit who is not serving God, who's walked away from truth, who is an embarrassment to the family, I ask tonight you'd have mercy, oh God. Preserve that life and please bring that person home. We said last night, oh God, we speak your word. We speak your word. We speak your word. Your word is that this promise is to you and your children. And so we call the children back home. And I pray for Reverend Davis and his family. Lord, we refuse to take him for granted. We did not know that you saved him since he was four. He made a decision sometime after to serve you, but you saved him since he was four. And tonight, God, we don't glorify a man. We don't make him a God, but we honor you for what you have done. Now you've preserved him to benefit our lives. Right now, God, we by faith lay hands on his head. And we ask, Lord, that you will pour a fresh anointing and release of your Holy Spirit upon him. And where he's become tired in his mind and tired in his spirit and discouraged, oh God, by the circumstances in which he ministers. Let there be a refreshing of the Holy Spirit in his life tonight, Father. Open his eyes of understanding. Cause him to see, God, that beyond Elijah, there are many others who have not bowed to Baal. Give him a fresh vision. Cause that under his churchship, the Methodist church would explode in growth and development. We thank you for doing this. I declare over you tonight, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. And amen. Come on, brothers and sisters, we can put our hands together. Just be seated briefly before we leave. Um, you, you are aware tonight is our last gathering of this nature um, because tomorrow night we, we continue tomorrow night at the hall with for the, the young people and so please you have a nephew a niece a godson a grandson make a special effort to encourage them them to be there tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. If you, if you, well, there's another side of Reverend Hestick you haven't seen. The young people see that tomorrow. Um, so please encourage. We have been saying transportation is available. So if you want to come and you're not sure about transportation, call the office, speak with the stewards. Um, something will be worked out because we want to make sure that every one of our young people have the opportunity to be there tomorrow. And on Thursday and Friday, we're doing something different. Um, it's just a small team and we will be driving around Tongo, Sogo, So, and stopping at different points 
where Reverend Hestick will be just sharing a little five-minute message with those people who are gathered in particular areas. So, you know, we obviously, places like Ace Day, Middle Street, and, and several places, we know, we see some of them, you know, that you have a lot of, especially young men and others, they just day, and so the intention is to just stop there for a couple of minutes and share a word with them, and there would be some other persons who would be there, you know, available to pray with persons as is needed and so forth. So it's, it's the first time we're doing this. It's not the prayer caravan. That's a different experience. Um, this is, a, a, we call it a mission, um, mobile, mobile mission, something like that. And so please remember it in prayer. It's different, but it is one of the ways we are trying to see how we could take the gospel to people on the blocks and in places that who would normally not come to church. So please remember it in prayer. Are you with me? So while tonight is the last we gather like this, um, the work continues. And so please remember in prayer. And then on the 15th, that is the Saturday before Father's Day, all men, you know, the young men to the older men, we are arranging for the Annasville playing field. And so on that Saturday, it would be cricket, soup, and reasoning. And so the intention we, is that not a regular cricket match. It's going to be a cricket match with a difference. So it's going to be a lot more excitement. And, and so it's, it's for the men, all men. So all the men who are here, it's a Saturday before Father's Day from 3 o'clock. And we are finalizing Annasville playing field. All the men. So if you're next to a man, just give them a little hunch there for me. Now tell them Saturday before Father's Day. Make sure you're there. Give them a hunch, man. Take it serious. Let them know. You expect them to be there. All right? So in your own congregations, I, I could say, brother, stay put on one time between him and Reverend Charles. The men from North Leeward, he would organize, they would organize the transportation and the other congregations up this side. I know like Brother Beatty from here and so forth would organize. Brother Citroy, I'm sure would organize fellas from that side. So it is going to be a, a, a big thing and a wonderful thing as we have um, cricket, soup, and reasoning. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know men like to reason a little bit, so we go reason a little bit. All right, so that is the Saturday before Father's Day. We will, of course, say thanks to Pastor Hestick at the end of the week. But because you are all here, I just want to use the opportunity as well to say thanks for what he has shared and the ministry has shared with us so far, Sunday, Monday, and tonight. Um, let's put our hands together again. <clears throat> Powerful, insightful, challenges us to really reflect on the word and and, and one of the things that um, we have tried to be very deliberate about when we have Aldous Gate, we have tried, is the persons we bring, we try to ensure that they are persons who will give us something to chew on. You know, I know a lot of church today, people prefer to take a little glass of milk that they could drink down nice and easy. But, you know, we have to try our best to, to have a little more, you know, meat in the matter. And so we thank God for Reverend Hestick, and he didn't come alone. We thank God for Mrs. Hestick, who has not been well, but she had to be here. And we thank God for both of them. As again, I said we're not done yet, but because this is our last such gathering, um, Brother Gerand, I would have asked him to, you know, organize these two nights of services. Because, you know, you have to give him responsibility and so forth. Um, just, just, just for information, two things. You know, the Connectional Council had been meeting around now. They finished today's Tuesday. They finished today. So we will hear whether or not they have decided um, for him to come into UTC September 2018 or to respect 2019, sorry, or as the district would have requested for him to go 2020. Um, so that's something we have to pray about. I, 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 it's a conversation I am also having with the connection about how we see ministry in our church and so forth. 
But in the meantime, and I'm saying this to say this, um, the district, we are trying to facilitate the development of a distance component to the training at UTC. So please hear me well, because I, I, I'm, I'm throwing out for information deliberately. What we, the, our district is trying to facilitate is a system where persons can do part of their theological training um, while not being fully residential in Jamaica. So they could use the internet and be, have the classes and that kind of a thing. Um, we had initial discussions with Open Campus hoping that there could have been a merge, but that will be a very costly endeavor. So we are looking now for an IT person, somebody who is sufficiently qualified, um, trained, who could help us to put together. It's a simple, well, I was speaking with Brother Ronnie Daniel, it's a simple thing, but for IT people, you just need somebody who could do estimates for cameras to go in classes, a platform online that they will use and so forth. And we want somebody who can put together that proposal for us. So if you know anybody who is an IT um, expert, please let me know because we want to deal with this matter urgently. Are you following me here? All right, so, so we thank Brother Gerand for um, coordinating the, and we want to thank all the other persons who have contributed Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, to Monday, Brother Monty led us last night. Of course, we know Brother Monty will do a wonderful job and several persons also participated in in the worship last night and some powerful testimonies last night um, or young people last night tonight or people have some very powerful testimonies i think we can put our hands together for those who shared some testimonies and those who were not you heard you heard the testimonies tonight those who were not there last night you missed out as well those testimonies last night very powerful um and to be truthful is your fault you should have <laughs> and so as we leave please remember to pray for the remaining week and pray for the hestics as they return and continue their work in guyana and continue to grow the work of god there i hope i haven't forgotten anything we of course give god thanks to the musicians and i i'm not going to say anything but um you know one musician one of the panists is from Annasville, one of the panists is from Kingstown, and I say no more yet. All right, are we, let's put our hands together again for them. And then we have the old bass man and drummer, and, and then, and of course, you know, the ever faithful, ever show, Brother Bailey upstairs there, put our hands together for Brother B. And, and so, Brother, and the, Brother Ken is up there, or song person and brother kevin you know now let me end by saying this you know god moves in a mysterious ways wonders to perform the projector had gone bad and uh, it was not until i had it was local preacher sunday i think it was so i was sitting in the congregation and that's when i realized that middle screen is a significant because depending on what you're saying, sitting, if that's not there, you're really handicapped. And then, of course, Aldous Gate was Sunday. And we were trying to get a replacement projector in, in time. And uh, it was supposed to get here. And then Wednesday, I think it was, it hadn't left yet. And so I, um, thanks to Brother Kevin Dixon at um, Correa's, he, he was helpful in trying to make sure we got the thing so saturday is when we collected the projector he on friday the documents came he got the documents sorted out friday evening late so that saturday we could get the projector so that sunday when you're here you see the projector and everything you didn't know the the way god worked to make sure it was possible and and god has a way of working things out you know but i have found that sometimes God likes to add a little excitement so that you could trust him. If it go too smooth, you trust yourself. But if it ain't go smooth, then you realize you have to say, Lord, please, are you with me? So if your life is going through a little excitement, don't panic. 
God just reminding you he's in charge. Amen? And so that's why we will end by singing, standing on the promises of God. Let us stand and sing to the glory of God. And standing on the promises of Christ, my King, through eternal ages, let the praises ring. Though in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear, by the living, by the living word of God, shall be there. Standing on the standing, standing. Standing on the promises of Christ, my Savior. Standing, I am standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing on the promises of Christ, the Lord. Standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, I am standing. We standing on the promises of God, our Savior. Standing, we are standing. We are standing on the promises of God, the last one. Yes. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. In the Savior has my heart in all. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing. I am standing. Oh, look, don't be hurry. I am standing on the Amen. <laughs> I had to go for bro to brother Ashley for a little help with that one day. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't reach the God. <laughs> Standing on the promises of God. Turn to somebody next to you. Tell them God bless you. And just before we say the benediction, please remember, it may not be you, but God could use you to touch somebody else's life and use that person that God used you to touch to do something great. Are you with me? It may not be you that does the great thing, quote unquote, but God could use you to cause somebody else to do something great. So let's be faithful in touching the lives of others. Amen? Just touch somebody. Just touch them. Eh? Symbolically, just touch them. And as we go, I pray, just as we touch today, that it would be that we touch the lives of others we meet. Let us pray. Together the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Good night. God bless you.